Corruption is a buzzword in Nigeria. We like to debate about it sometimes, talk about it, or even blame it for all our problems. But are we truly tired of it? Professor Patrick Lumumba doesn't think that we're tired of it enough to get rid of it. And still on xenophobia, Nigerians leaving South Africa were frustrated by South African officials. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacone. Well, this is Plus Politics, and our discussion is on corruption. A former director of the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Agency, Professor Patrice Lumumba, uh, on Tuesday said the reason why corruption still thrived in the country was because the people are not yet tired of the practice. Now, he said in a society such as Nigeria, where people still celebrated that those who were fraudulently enriching themselves, corruption would continue to thrive. Now, strong words, but very deep truths. I'm being joined in the studio by Daniel Odufe. He's a lawyer. And of course, Dikbo Olayokun is a journalist and a political analyst. It's good to have you join us, gentlemen. Yeah, it's so it's to be okay. So I will start with you, Dikbo, because you have been in the field. You have covered all kinds of stories. Governments have come and governments have gone. You have seen almost seen it all and it seems like the the word corruption is thrown around at will and especially for this government they came in with the mantra zero tolerance for corruption but as we speak corruption still hangs above our heads every single day so in the words of Patrice Lumumba are we really tired of corruption you mean as Nigerians mm -hmm. no because in um, one way or the other, I, I know that Nigeria is directly or, directly or indirectly benefiting from corruption. How so? Let me just digress a bit. Interestingly, the man who spoke, that's uh, Professor Lumumba, mm -hmm. uh, is from Kenya. And I was in Kenya in June this year. The guy who served as my tour guide, we were together for about five days, from morning till night. And to the guy, he believed that their country, that Kenya, is the most corrupt country in the world. I patiently listened to him. But interestingly, the same problem that permeates the society in Kenya is what we're expressing in Nigeria. According to the guy, he said the people are unable to do anything because somehow corruption has overwhelmed them. Kenya, by the standard of Nigeria, is a poor country, well organized, well ordered. He said many of them see these things because these corrupt politicians flaunt it in their eyes, before their faces, mm. but there's nothing they can do. And he gave reasons. Lack of education, attachment to ethnicity, and then uh, weak uh, structures to fight corruption. Intensely, let us now bring it to Nigeria. Let me just use our, our profession as an example. Just sorry, it's a, it's a pity I have to use our profession. Oh, well. Yes. There's the popular brown envelope syndrome oh, in our profession. <laughs> I am talking from experience. Two political parties, PDP and a small party, let's just say New Nigeria People's Party, have invited journalists to their functions. There is that preponderance for an average Nigerian journalist to want to attend the PDP APC pro pro program, event rather, because of what is going to follow it. And now, the problem is, let me use another example of the maritime industry where I operate. Everybody is shouting. Customs people are corrupt. Everybody is shouting. But an average importer believes that the only way he can make it is to change the system. What happens? This corrupt, this what do you call it? The customs you are accusing of being corrupt. Instead of paying one million naira, you go and recommend with the customer. Let me pay five hundred. You take two hundred. We pay two hundred. The government covers. It takes two to tango, and that is the reason why it is very, very important, difficult for corruption to be tackled in Nigeria, because one way or the other, we got entangled in it, and it's only when it doesn't benefit us that we shout corruption. Hmm. But when it involves us, if somebody, somebody has been arrested by the police, you get to the police station, bill is free. 
<laughs> then the man says, so if you don't take care, this man is going to sleep over the weekend. What do you do as a Nigeria? You call the police officer aside. How do I get my people out? That is the system. It has permitted from top to down. And Nigerians will be talking about corruption. But the next minute, the person himself is involved. Because it has become part of us. We don't see it as anything bad. But, 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 and I'm trying to establish where we all got it wrong. <laughs> but before then, I just want to follow you up because you're saying it has eaten deep into the fabrics. It's become part of us. The, every time we talk about corruption, we quickly point to politicians. And I always ask the question, where do these politicians come from? Mars? maybe Pluto, they're from amongst us. They are mem family members, they are friends, they are church members. So where did we get it wrong? Because you cannot solve a problem without finding the root cause of the problem. Um, OK, um, how do we solve the problem? Um, I think one uh, source that readily comes to mind is a value system, a value system as a people. If we are going to be honest with ourselves, our value system still accommodates and recognizes corruption as not being corruption, not being as serious as it ought to be taken. Let me give you a good instance. Many Nigerians still believe that if you have the opportunity of serving in public office and you decide to do what you know is the right thing to do, which then means that you know resources, abundant resources, you know, are not coming to you. Your family members, more often than not, will be the first people to question you. In fact, they will think that something is actually wrong with you. <laughs> and that is that's the reality. Our value system. So when, to answer the question, how do you get wrong? From our homes, from our schools. If you if you and, and for me as a young person, the biggest worry for me, with due respect to, uh, to our daddy here, you know, we can say, oh, okay, so they don't do us. I mean, in their time, they didn't do well. Mm. If you listen to some of young people like me and you. And you hear them talk, then you'll be really worried that in fact, we're not even getting right during that time. So the value system of the average Nigerian, because like it's always said, if people deserve the government they get. But you see, I'm digging deeper. <laughs> when I was a child, I would not as, as much as go home with a pencil that did not belong to me that my parents didn't buy for me. You understand what I'm saying? But today you bring a G Wagon home. And we threw a party and we say, oh, my son or my daughter has arrived. But you know that her earnings or his earnings cannot buy that. So what, where did we dump that off? At what point in Nigeria? Because I'm still alive. It's not like I'm dead or I'm, I'm in my 50s. It, it wasn't like this before. Let me give you an example. I have a friend, he's a lawyer, Barrister T. Ongibo. He was in Lagos before. I think he has relocated to where he now. We were discussing one day. He said when he was a small boy, his elder brother, like the firstborn of the family, graduated from the university. And then he left uh, their village and to uh, uh, Enugun. Enugun was well, like, to an average woman then, it's like if you have gone to Enugun from your village, you have traveled out of the country. <laughs> it's about, after about four months, the man came home with a Volkswagen car, Volkswagen, two doors. You know, the children were very happy. Mm -hmm. Her brother has bought a new car home. The wives, everybody jumping around, women, neighbors, everybody. He said, but in the midst of all this, he noticed that his father, their father was not happy. Mm -hmm. Then he was looking, this man don't come again. This man has witness. But children, they are less concerned. He said, after all the Fourier had died down, the man beckoned to the senior brother, that's the father, called him into his room. No children now. They started to drop. The man was asking the his son, you left village four months ago. You came out of the four months ago to an to buy a Virgin car. Where did you get the money to buy this car? The boy said to him, he just felt his father was the usual, strict, everybody feared him, was afraid of him because he's strict. He said, but it was later that he now realized the import of that message. Mm. You left the university four years, four months ago. Where did you get the money to buy this car? That was the Nigerian society. That was the society some of us grew up to meet. But all of a sudden, like a barrister said, if somebody goes into office, you want to be Mr. Integrity, 
your name, your family will remember telling you that come. Like when I was there, this is what he came out with. Are you on that course? <laughs> so the question we should be asking ourselves is where did we get it wrong? Because it wasn't like this in the, in, in, in the society that some of us grew up with. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Take the traffic situation in Lagos today. As, as I am today, if I'm carrying some of my colleagues, and then you see guys following one way because there's heavy traffic, you know that if I, I am telling you the truth, if I want to do it, something will pinch me and say, what will my father say? Mm. Even as I am today, mm. I will say, what will my father Because when my father was alive, he was to me, at times I would ask this man, I would ask people, is this man, this my father, the way he was treating me? But unfortunately for me, the man died while I was a small boy. Mm -hmm. But much, much later, I started missing the man. The African society recognized values. There is a minimum standard that you must manifest. That's why they call it, your call it mm -hmm. That is, oh, this one is a good ambassador. Mm -hmm. But those things, nobody, nobody care again. And some of us, some people believe it, had, it started after the Civil War. And I remember that some of us who were trained after the Civil War, we still had that fear. I think the problem started immediately after 19, between 1985, 86, 87, when the former president, IBB, was there. It, it, literally two things count when you're talking of the value system. Because when somebody does it, and nobody seems to want to say anything, it becomes the norm. Mm. But if in the society, uh, somebody was telling us that there is a community in Nigeria today, they are notorious for their girls going out for international prostitution. They say even parents were borrowing money from neighbors to send these girls into prostitution abroad. Parents that were brought up under a sound system. So that is what you call the essence and the impact of pollution. They said, um, if you show me your friend, and I'll tell you the type of person you are. At times, some of these things happen through peer group influence, mm. at times. And then at times, the problem of, some people also believe that the modernization in the, in the uh, African setup, how do I mean? The mother is a white colored job person, the same thing with the father. They, fall, they both live in off a house in the morning. More often than not, leave them in the care of the housemaid. That is if they are the privileged type. Mm -hmm. And then those who don't, they just leave these boys, these children, when they come back from school, they begin to mingle with people around. And there is no way they will not be contaminated for using that word advisedly. So, Barista just made a little allusion to it. The home. What, we are, what is the role of the home? Because the formative age of a person is between age one and five. And that is where the home is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Then two, the religious leaders. In the traditional setting, more often than not, the religious leader, like the catechist, evangelist, is also the teacher in the school. When we were growing up, there was one man, very rich man, very rich man, he was working in the local government then. We didn't know how the sort of his wealth <laughs> is, mm. until we grew up to know that local government is just a cesspool of corruption. This man, do you know that as old as that man was, if he was quarreling with his wife, and the wife says, I will report to the pastor, or reverend, we're not using pastor then. I will report to the pastor, or reverend, we're not using pastor, reverend. The man will shrink because the religious leader occupied a prime position mm -hmm. of respect, of integrity, by virtue of the way they but lived their that, life. But all that has been lost right now. <laughs> I mean, literally, nobody even cares. But aside from, my point is that every time we talk about corruption, we're very quick to point to the man in local government. We're quick to point to the person who's in power. But we, f we fail to look at ourselves. So you walk into a ministry and you need to get something done. But because you refuse to pay a thousand naira, that file will not move from that table. So this is also, we, we seemingly are part of the problem. I'd like to quote um, Professor Lumumba. He said that uh, corruption is a crime against humanity. Experiences have demonstrated that if a people in a country are sufficiently fed up, they will rise up. And he made um, 
a point about Romania, that we saw that the people themselves were dissatisfied with the conduct of their party officials and they changed the attitude you know, of their leadership. So maybe we too are somewhat benefiting, like he said, or we are part of the problem, we're fueling it, but we always are quick to point fingers at our leaders. That's the reason why corruption continues to fester. Could that be? I agree. I agree absolutely that um, um, to a very large extent, many Nigerians benefit one way or another. Is it that they are currently benefiting or it's about to get to their turn? So, you know, so when you now say, oh, we want to change the system, you say, no, I've been faithful for this way. It is my turn. You cannot, ch you cannot change the arrangement. We, we, you know, so that's to a large extent. And, and to a large extent, I agree with um, Professor Lumumba because, um, you know, um, issue is replete with examples of people being fed up and taking action. And unfortunately, you know, the elements that will, you know, enable us to get to that point, somehow it's missing because, number one, the people need to be unanimous, you know, there's at least to a large extent, you know, the, the, the majority of the people need to get to that point that they say, look, we do not want the status quo. But we're divided. Isn't we're divided. that also so, part of the so, problem? So that's always, that's always a challenge. That's number one. Then apart from that, you know, um, the fact that, you know, like I said earlier, the fact that, you know, um, interest here and there, you know, benefits here and there, no matter how little, gets to you. And then let's not also take away the fact that it's actually it's incredibly difficult to be an upright man today. If I mean let, let's let's actually be let's be honest with ourselves. As we look at it, for example, you mentioned or let's say let's look at the, the issue of um trying to get your passport, for example, you need your passport. Oh. You know, I mean it's, it's as simple let's as that. Oh no, let's not no, go no, there. I mean, but these are I mean, things it's supposed to be straightforward. But me and you know that if you want to go by the books, you spend ages and just sometimes say so things like that, and you're like how am I going to? So, so it's Even incredibly when you go difficult. by the book, sometimes you're scammed. <laughs> right <laughs> so, there. So, so it's incredibly difficult to, to be an upright person in Nigeria. And all of that, we need to realize that, look, we stand to gain more if things are done properly. And I think that's in the gospel, or that's a message that the average Nigerian still do not understand. But yeah. who's going to propagate this gospel in your words? Because the media can only talk about it. We can only try to you know, light a torch, but who's going to come light their own torch with our, from our torch? You understand where I'm going? Because Lubumba again is saying that he feels that Nigerians, as just like Africans are, are a bit like a testicle about this issue. We only just scream blue murder, and then we go back to sleep, and we really don't do anything. We just talk about it when it's favorable or it's not our man that is sitting there. Yeah, the problem is, um, that doesn't mean we don't have very few upright men in Nigeria up to today. We do so. But the point is, we are looking at uh, the environment, the overall, let me say, majority. And it, at times, I sit down. I have a friend, um, Barista Fred Dezako. There was a day we just finished a television program. Then I was riding in his car with him. And he turned to me and said, well, that was about six, seven years ago. The question continued to ring every day in my ear. He said, do you think Nigeria will ever be good again? I was taking off balance because the question, I didn't know where it was coming from. I said, how do you mean? He said, it's a question, answer. You see, when you are looking at the depth of the rot, we pray to God that God will do something quick. Oh. My goodness, I, I, I'm yes, sorry, because with due respect to all those who pray, I pray, but I just feel that we over-religious. No, 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 no. We, it's, we, it's, it's, we, it's we, not. We're too overly no. religious and we spiritualize too many things that we're not supposed to. On our to. own, it is almost impossible to, it is almost. Have we even gotten to the doing part of it? We haven't. It we is when the thing crosses your mind that you will do it. <laughs> it is something that is in your mind that you will do. Mm. But this thing is completely are we out of our minds. But are we not suffering from the... I mean, the fallout of corruption. But as no, much as a few, hand, a handful of people are benefiting, the larger, the vast majority. It depends is on what you are looking at at corruption. Somebody who works into a passport office, you saw, you met a long queue there. A passport officer come to you and say, "Oh boy, do you want to join this queue? They are paying twenty-five thousand. Pay fifty thousand." But you, the man who cannot afford to join I, that I, you line pay, still listen, listen, you paid fifty thousand. You got your passport the following day. Do you think the man has not benefited? Do you think he believed there's any evil in corruption? The percentage. That's what I'm saying. The percentage of guys who are benefiting from these sharp practices. It, that's why I said you have to look at the issue of corruption because of one way or the other, one way or the other, we are connected directly or indirectly. It, it has, what, what is it you want to do in this country? 
that you want to get? Is it bail? Is it passport? Driver's license? And you take only a few? Almost all of us are involved, directly, indirectly. It has become part of way, a way of life. Mm. That is the real issue. Because who is that person that is going to say, okay, the, uh, my current passport, I got it about six months ago. The one I got before then, before it expired. I said, okay, I was going to wait until the normal thing was done. <laughs> my sister, I got the passport 18 months after. Mm. Because I said I was going, and some of my friends will just walk in, get their passport, and say, are you sure it is original? They say, but we did some printing now. <laughs> so, and you, and a lot of, so it, it requires divine intervention. Because it has become way of life. And when you want to deviate, let me use that word. Mm. If you want to say, okay, you want to stick to the rules, mm. you are the one that they see as the deviant. That is, that, that is the irony. It's, and it's really sad. On, and that is why the church has to wake up. And first of all, the homes have to be alive to their responsibility. And the home itself, are they clean? Mm. The mother and the mother? The type of life, like my friend we always say, he said uh, one day you were in the sitting room, then your friend came knocking, then you asked your son to go and check who's there, tell him I'm not around. I think the boy will not grow up to be telling lies. Mm. That is how these things start. But then when we were growing up, not all of these things were alien to us. But when we, well, all of us got involved in it, it's the issue. But first of all, what is very, very important, if at all we are going to get out of it, is there must be appropriate sanction for evil to us. That is very, very key. But if the system is corrupt, who's going to sanction who? <laughs> Cut off your nose to spite your face? Uh, quickly, um, Daniel, where do we go from here? Because it looks like uh, we need divine intervention, like he said. Indeed. Um, <laughs> I mean, we need a bit of that, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need a bit of um, divine intervention. But beyond that, you know, as a people, um, so I always see this, you know, as a two-way thing. First and foremost, lasting solution always comes from the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to get to that point because I still think that the average Nigerian thinks because look at look at this. Every every human being is naturally selfish, mm -hmm. right? So we believe that okay. So I mean, if I'm going to benefit, no matter how little from this, why should I? Until we are made to understand that look, if things are done the proper way. Mm -hmm, we we all ultimately benefit from it in mm -hmm. in massive ways mm -hmm. until we, until we appeal to that until people understand that even if thinking selfishly it pays to put proper checks and order into mm -hmm. society because ultimately when you cut ways you bribe your ways and all that you know the jobs that should have been created you know you get married your children go up it's no job for them you know mm -hmm. your, your younger sister your younger but you know if one if we if we if until we i mean if you if you walk into um a mall or maybe a restaurant in the u.s or in the uk or anywhere and then you try to 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 to, to engage in sharp practice the guy knows that look if i allow you this this thing you know, it's going to come back to bite me yeah. because I probably will not yeah. get my salary. So mm. we, we need to probably look for a way to and to, to get the people to understand. That's why I said on, on one hand, people need to understand. On the other hand, the government as well, because you cannot do anything without them. If the political will is there, the current admission says that they have the political will, but me and you, unfortunately, I, I believe that, you know, that, that political will, there's so much, you know, you know, what's that double standard, you mm. know, so all of those things, you know, nobody will take it serious if there is double standard. So on the part of the rulers, on the part of the, of the government, Th that commitment needs to be there and it needs to be sincere. On the part of people, we need to be united, you know, on, on the points that we need to eliminate corruption and put order. And Once and for all. Well, uh, Daniel Odube is a lawyer, Digbo Olayoko is a journalist and political analyst. They're not going anywhere. We'll take a short break and when we come back, we'll be talking about the evacuation plan of at least 640 Nigerians from South Africa. It was met with resistance. We'll get to talk about it when we come back from the break.